Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm very um, pleased that the governor is here with Suzanne Young, his secretary of the Agency of Administration, and Adam Gresham, who's the commissioner of the Department of Finance and Management. So thank you all very much for coming. And thank you all for coming on a very cold morning. Um, <laughs> it was 13 below at my house in Hardwick, so I, I, it was pretty cold here, too, I understand from what Suzanne was saying. So. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, we're going to be focusing our conversation this morning on the budget. And so this is going to be a combination of uh, questions from uh, the Digger staff and from the audience, and our, our readership, rather, is a better way to put it. Um, although there might be questions from you in the audience here, too. We had that happen last week. Um, so, uh, Governor, I wanted to start with uh, an easy softball for you. <laughs> That's what we like. <laughs> um, how would you describe your relationship with lawmakers this year? Well, thank you, Ann. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting us all here today. It's great to be here at the History Center, uh, as well as providing bagels and coffee. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, we, uh, you know, we're enjoying uh, a, a new, fresh, clean slate this year. I, I think it's uh, refreshing in many ways when we look across the country and see all the dysfunction, uh, especially in D.C., and all the controversy uh, that, uh, you know, we took it upon ourselves. I, I said uh, that we have to change our approach. Uh, we're going to do it differently. Uh, we're going to try and do uh, a lot more listening, a lot more collaborating. Uh, and uh, so far, so good. Uh, we've been well received in the in the committees. Uh, treated with respect and civility is something that is important to me, and I think it's important uh, to our future, to our kids, uh, to be better role models. And it all starts with with each and every one of us. So uh, I have a role to play in that. Uh, acknowledge that. And uh, so I think uh, again, uh, we've been uh, it's been cordial, uh, respectful, and uh, I hope it uh, continues. But there's always. You know, there's always controversy. Uh, there's always turmoil. It doesn't matter what uh, what administration it is, what legislative body it is. Uh, there's always tension, natural tension, and that's and that's okay. Uh, but it's how we debate, how we choose to debate each other, and how we choose to do that is uh, is really uh, what's incumbent upon each and every one of us. Great, do you do you want it? I mean, do you want it? Sure, I'd be happy to add to that. I think uh, what the governor has just um, spoken about has actually already played out in terms of budget adjustment. We went into the budget adjustment process with some ideas for the legislature on how to use um, the surplus one-time money that we accumulated uh, to make a, um, a start on lead testing on some of our cybersecurity needs and, and paying down some of the pension liabilities, and that was well received. We've worked together, uh, and you know, we've if things go well this week in the Senate budget adjustment uh, process, I think you'll see some success from working together. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, Governor, um, and this is a little harder, this question. <laughs> We've dipped our toe in the water. Um, you took issue last month with the media's focus on what you called small and specific new taxes in your budget proposal. If you did not think this was a significant break from previous years, why did you issue your letter in the middle of the last legislative session stating your opposition to a list of bills, some with similarly small and specific taxes, including an e-cigarette tax? Yeah, fair, fair question. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, when I talked about our list of accomplishments this year and, and maybe uh, some uh, view of changing a position. Uh, it was more of an acknowledgement uh, and, and somewhat of a, a change in, in tactic uh, in some respects. I said, well, I ran my first time out, I said that we needed a correction in Vermont, uh, that we were spending beyond our means. Uh, I thought we needed to live within our means. I didn't believe that we needed to raise any taxes or fees to do it. Uh, we presented budgets that I thought would accomplish that. So we. Uh, and, and I was uh, steadfast in that. I did put a line in the sand and said, you know, no more tax and fees, not for these two years. Uh, and, I, and I thought it was needed. Uh, and, and I thought it, was, it benefited the state as a result. Uh, I think we saw there was economic growth without raising tax and fees. 
I think it uh, gave Vermonters a break uh, individually and, and, and the businesses as well, and, and I think we're better off for it. So during the campaign, I, I was asked about whether we were going to uh, be raising any fees, or whether we are going to consider any new taxes, uh, and I said uh, consistently that uh, I wasn't putting a line in the sink. Uh, that, uh, that acknowledged that we went through the first two years and we may have to, to change, and, but it would be a high bar uh, as well, that we weren't going to just automatically uh, increase fees across the, across the board or uh, look to increase as a knee-jerk reaction to anything, uh, but, but there would be consideration of that. So uh, it wasn't, I, I don't think it should have been a surprise when uh, this year it came out, uh, one of the, the surprises might have been with uh, e-cigarettes uh, that I, I said that we needed to, I thought this was a uh, public health issue, uh, and that uh, particularly with our kids, uh, and that we should be raising the tax uh, accordingly uh, to prevent more use amongst our, our, our youth. Uh, as well, uh, we looked for opportunities to, uh, uh, to, to modernize our tax code, uh, particularly with the Wayfair decision and the online sales tax, uh, that there were other areas of opportunity to, to make sure that it was, uh, we had some parities of, uh, within the, uh, with the Brooks and Water uh, uh, businesses in our downtowns, uh, that, that we brought that in line. So we found some opportunities there. Um, so across the board, I wouldn't say it was a drastic change, uh, more of a transition, uh, and, uh, and so, Again, I, I think that uh, we'll, that will all play out. Uh, I believe that uh, Vermonters are well served. Uh, we still are living within our means, so to speak, but we have found some areas that, uh, that we could uh, bring in more revenue. The bottom line is uh, that we are seeing more revenue, even after, again, two years of no tax and fees, uh, for, for the most part, uh, we're seeing uh, more revenue come in to the bottom line. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the frustration is that we have some upward pressures as well. Uh, so a lot of that, uh, that surplus, uh, that money on the bottom line has been used up in, uh, in some of those upward pressures. Anything? Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. I just wanted to uh, remind some listeners with uh, more uh, active memories, if I remember when we presented the budget um, last year, one of the questions we got almost immediately was, um, are there no new taxes and no new fees? And our response then, and it is the same today, is, you know, last year and the year before, we, we hit the pause button. There was no religious or spiritual objection to raising fees or taxes, but they were our last resort. And I think that's true today. We've had two years to look over the landscape. We've had a couple of years to look at all the programs we run within government to speak actively with our agency secretaries and commissioners within the departments. And so we know where the pressures are and we know where the pressures are not. And so I think what you see this year are decisions made uh, that reflect those areas that we believe uh, need um, some guidance. But, you know, we said then, and it's still true today, that, you know, raising taxes or fees are a last resort, but there's no spiritual objection to that. Thank you. Spirituality and taxes in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Hugh Williams from Shelburne uh, has a question pertaining to the 2018 tax re reform law enacted mid-year, which resulted in the removal of any medical deductions on Vermont state taxes. While impacting people of all ages, this change particularly impacts those in our senior community who encounter major medical outlays. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, voluntary charitable contributions were granted a limited tax credit, and yet non-voluntary medical expenses received no deduction or credit. Even the 2019 Vermont Taxpayer Advocates Report points out that there is a small but vulnerable population with high medical expenses relative to their adjusted gross income, an area that a taxpayer cannot plan for or reduce, and suggests a proposed resolution, amend our income tax statute to include a medical expenses deduction or credit. 
Going forward, what do you plan to do to ensure that tax mitigation in this area is accomplished? Well, I'll take a stab at that first and then maybe let others speak to that directly. Um, you know, there was a lot going on over the last two years, uh, particularly on the federal level, uh, with uh, tax changes, and we tried to keep up. Uh, that's why we we made some changes to the, uh, the the income tax as a result from Vermont income tax, uh, so uh, so that we could uh, maintain uh, again fairness for Vermont taxpayers. Uh, this was an area I believe that uh, was maybe overlooked uh, and. Particularly in Wake Robin, we've heard uh, a lot of uh, some of the concerns there, uh, and uh, I believe they're founded. And we'll have to take a look and see what we can do. I know our, our commissioner of uh, taxes is is looking at that at this point uh, because we want there to be fairness across the board. Uh, we we saw uh, that in terms of the charitable contributions. Uh, I believe what we came up with uh, was unique. Uh, I think it was fair. Uh, we, we acknowledge that uh, we have a lot of nonprofits in Vermont. Uh, we want there to be uh, some sort of benefit to giving. Uh, so that's why we came up with the concept that w we did uh, to, to maintain that. And we'll see whether it plays out. Uh, uh, we won't know that probably until, until this time around, maybe the, the next year as well and trying to maintain that uh, because uh, we, uh, we want to make sure that the, they're, they're important uh, to, our, to Vermont, uh, to the way we do business, our, our tolerance, our compassion for others, uh, and we want to make sure that we uh, maintain that. But uh, the, the, medical, um, the medical expenses uh, for that, uh, that population is something that is concerning to me, uh, and I know that we're, we're looking at that as we speak. Do you have anything to add to that, Suzanne? Um, no, we are looking at that. As the governor pointed out, there was a lot going on with the um, federal tax reform. Our tax department acted very quickly and um, very in-depth in terms of coming up with a plan in early February to offset the impacts on working families. And again, there are deductions that have gone away that have had impacts. And, I, and as the governor pointed out, the tax commissioner has brought that to our attention and is in conversation with legislators and um, looking to see if the week there is a solution to that. Great, thank you. This question is from Robert Anderson of Bristol. And he wants to know, many, many Vermont seniors on Social Security have difficulty with increasing property taxes. Would Governor Scott's administration be willing to consider a change in the way the education tax adjustment is calculated so as to exempt some of the Social Security earnings, for example, up to $20,000 from household income? This would help many retirees to keep their homes. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's many ways to, uh, to answer that in some respects. Um, I'm always willing to listen uh, to, to a different approach uh, to how we uh, collect uh, our education taxes, uh, so to speak. It's been uh, mostly based on, on, uh, on property taxes, although this, this past session uh, we did use uh, the sales tax as well um, to pay for education. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of issues. One is that uh, it really does uh, uh, make us, it makes us focus on what the real uh, challenges that we face in Vermont. And I believe it's about workforce, it's about uh, trying to, to bring more people into the state. Uh, throughout the campaign, I, I encountered someone, and I mentioned it in my, uh, uh, in my uh, State of the State address, I believe, or maybe my budget address, uh, that uh, someone had remarked, uh, we don't need more taxes in this state, we need more taxpayers. Uh, and I thought uh, that was simplistic in some ways, but true. Uh, what we need are more people paying in. Uh, we have a stagnant population, uh, somewhat of a decline uh, last year. Uh, we have more people, uh, we have more people dying than being born in the state. Uh, so we need to, to encourage more families, we need to to be more attractive uh, to families and, and uh, particularly those uh, seeking opportunities uh, to come to the state, and that's why we're focusing on that to spread uh, some of the uh, some of the burden uh, across uh, all taxpayers. 
So uh, as we age, uh, you know, we, we have more of a, an aging population, so we have more people that uh, have uh, low income, uh, maybe a uh, higher uh, value in, in property. Uh, so I, I understand their pain, uh, and, I, and I'm willing to look at that. But we need to look at our whole system as well. Uh, we we spend a lot for education in Vermont. Uh, it's one of it's the the largest state expenditure in the state government, uh, about 1.7 billion dollars. So we have to do things differently, uh, as I've stated before. I, I believe that we need to uh, to look more in uh, developing the foundation of our kids. Uh, we need to spend more in early care and learning. Uh, I think that the cradle to career concept makes a lot of sense uh, to try and give them that foundation uh, so that we can uh, uh, provide for them and provide for a career path for them uh, in their future as well in uh, career and technical education as well. So uh, that cradle to career concept is something that uh, is near and dear uh, to my heart and something that I think is doable and we can make, uh, we can have the best uh, the best education system in the country as a result, bring more families in, spread the risk and the burden out more uh, amongst our taxpayers. Uh, but if we if we do all this at the same time, I'm, I'm more than willing to take a look at, uh, at ways we can reduce the burden on our on our senior population. Yeah. I don't think it's fair to take this into the deep dive into property tax mechanism. But I, you know, I would say, I think our tax commissioner last year said that there's each individual property owner has to do over 20 calculations just to determine his or her property tax rate. And the more complexity we put into it, the more calculations that have to be done and the more separated you become from the basic decision of a school budget translating into a property tax rate. So um, I would go back to the governor's original comment that the issue is not our property tax rate system, but more how much we're spending and the growth um, in the uh, school spending. So I think that's really where we have to concentrate, not making our um, mechanism more complex. Um, on that topic, um, just to follow up question, what initiatives are you, you know, what, what steps are you taking this year to address public education costs? Is there, there wasn't an emphasis on that in your budget address, and that's something that you really um, concentrate on the first biennium, and I wondered what, what follow-up there is that being taken on that. Well, th there was a bit of resistance uh, to uh, some of the proposals we made in the first two years. Uh, I don't, uh, and I get it, I understand uh, that we, uh, we have to focus on areas where we can work together. Uh, I'm looking, again, at, uh, at ways that we can enhance our education system, uh, particularly uh, with early uh, care and learning, uh, more with child care at this point in time, but I think it's, it's within, we know the child's uh, brain develops immensely fast, zero to five. So we need to get to them earlier or provide for uh, more education, more help in that regard, uh, as well with uh, child care. I think that that would help in terms of the workforce uh, and be more attractive to families coming to our state. So uh, trying to, to, uh, to enhance uh, more uh, career technical education, I think, is, uh, is something, again, that's important to me uh, as well uh, to focus on on trying to expand into uh, early care and learning is something that's important. Uh, and uh, and trying to find, uh, you know, reallocating the resources within uh, what we're spending today, I think, is important. Uh, we spend, again, a lot of money uh, for education. Uh, and uh, and so if we can find opportunities uh, to reallocate those uh, those resources within uh, the cradle to career approach, uh, I believe that we'll have a, a, a great system, one of the best in the country, and that we can highlight and showcase uh, so that we can use that uh, as, a, as a mechanism uh, to attract more people to the state and help, again, uh, in terms of, of spreading that risk amongst many. And, and I think that that's really important. We need more people. When I said before, uh, we, we don't need more taxes, we need more taxpayers. It's so true. And, and when you look at, at, at how um, 
the effect of, of one person coming into the system uh, and how that uh, uh, the ripple effect of that across the, the tax uh, system. It's uh, truly remarkable uh, how one person uh, can make a, a real difference uh, in, in bringing more revenue into the state. Thank you very much. Um, Peter Crawford from Bridport and Martha Hicks Poffitt from Wells both have questions about the clean water programs. And uh, Martha would like you to explain how you plan to pay for clean water. And Peter Crawford wants to know why there's so little mention in your clean water funding plan of the huge, he says, all caps, problem of combined sewer overflows that put over 35 million gallons of sewage tainted storm water in our lakes, mostly like Champlain, and rivers in 2018. Is it because separating sewer and storm drains is so expensive that it's not possible to fund? Yeah. The, this, where to start? Um, in terms of, uh, of focusing on uh, cleaning up our waterways, streams, and lakes uh, is something that we're committed to. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had an increase of spending, a dramatic increase of spending over the last uh, few years. We, we, uh, we're committed to that. Uh, and finding ways to address that, I think the legislature has an interest, we have an interest, uh, we're trying, we put a proposal together uh, that we think makes a lot of sense. Uh, we, we have a dedicated source uh, with uh, using part of the estate tax uh, in doing so. We think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and so we're moving forward. I, I think, again, this is something that will work out with the legislature, uh, but, uh, but we're all pulling in the same direction. We may have different approaches on, on, on how to do it, but, uh, but I think we're, we're all committed to, to the appropriate level of spending. Uh, in terms of uh, the sewer storm separation projects, we, for the last 20 or 30 years, we've had what's called the CSO uh, uh, program uh, in this, because a lot of uh, communities have, uh, have uh, were combined, uh, sewer and storm. So we're trying to separate them uh, at this point in time. Montpelier's done a lot uh, in that regard. It costs a lot of money uh, to do so. But then, you know, what do you do after uh, as well, once you separate the two, uh, which is important because we want to make sure uh, that, uh, that we're just treating uh, the, the septic portion of that, uh, the, the effluent in our uh, uh, treatment plants uh, to take the burden off of that. Uh, but then we have the stormwater discharge as well. We want to treat that uh, too. That's important uh, to do. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, with climate change, uh, climate change is real. Uh, we're seeing it, you know, we see the dramatic effects of that right here in Vermont right now. Uh, with all the significant snowfall we've seen this year alone, uh, I think we've had six or seven feet of snow in its, uh, in its entirety. Um, but we've lost almost that much in some areas as well. And we've had significant rain events uh, during the winter. So our climate's changing uh, dramatically, which uh, further uh, puts burden on the stormwater systems uh, that we have into place, which further uh, burdens some of the, uh, uh, the, the treatment facilities. So we, uh, we have a long ways to go. Uh, again, we're committed to doing as much as we can uh, in the meantime in trying to separate storm and, and sewer, uh, but, uh, but at the same time treating some of the storm uh, storm systems with stormwater discharge ponds and, and uh, different concepts uh, as we as we move forward I think we've uh, we've committed to uh, about 50 million dollars and Sam can go into maybe a little bit more detail on this but about 50 million dollars uh, in this year's budget alone for uh, stormwater thank you governor uh, the Clean Water um, Act uh, is I think in its third year of implementation now and when the when the Scott administration um, started back two years ago in January, we were hearing a lot of questions about what are we spending all this money on? Where is this money going? And Treasurer Pierce had had suggested a, a bridge plan using capital dollars primarily for the first two years. Um, we really very much appreciated that, and the Clean Water Board uh, has been working with the Clean Water Initiative, which has become combination of um, employees from agriculture, commerce, and 
and DEC um, to really get a handle on where is the money going, where is the money coming from. As the governor pointed out, there's $48 million in this budget um, of either state or federal money that passes through the state coffers. And that doesn't count the federal dollars and the private dollars that are going into clean water that we don't have a way to count. The Clean Water Initiative has done a masterful job of pulling together all the pieces and parts into one book budget. Um, and we have uh, proposed a, what is actually, I believe, the fourth funding stream into the, the Clean Water Fund this year. We have um, about $2 million a year coming from the students on bottle deposits. We have about $5 million coming from a surcharge in the property transfer tax. We have another 10 to $12 million uh, in the capital bill, plus the governor's proposal to direct some of the um, estate tax towards the Clean Water Fund alone. So we're making great progress, and if anybody really wants to see the work that's gone on in the state in every locality, the, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation's Clean Water Initiative website um, is so granular, it will tell you projects within your area that have been funded with the Clean Water Fund and other, and other funds. Great. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience. I don't know if um, folks have questions they want to ask. We, yes, please. Uh, Governor, based on the clear economic benefits provided to the rural Vermont economy by maintaining our trout stocking program and your stated goals of improving that economy through initiatives such as low rent, what steps are you and your administration taking to work with DC and Department of Fish and Wildlife to keep the Southbury Fish Culture Station? Um, when the Fish and Wildlife uh, Department uh, came to us this year, uh, they're facing a deficit of about a half a million dollars. Uh, as you probably are well aware, uh, the licenses, the number of licenses are decreasing. Uh, the costs of, uh, of uh, protecting uh, our, our natural resources in, in that program uh, and, and maintaining our wardens and so forth, uh, enforcing the laws, uh, are increasing. Um, so we were looking uh, for opportunities uh, to, to fill that, uh, and one of the, uh, the steps, one of the proposals that came forward uh, was to raise the uh, cost of licenses, uh, hunting and fishing licenses. Uh, I didn't think that was a good idea uh, because I felt as though uh, with the, the de decreasing amount of licenses sold, uh, that we're putting more burden on those who are just utilizing them. I, I know myself, I, I buy my hunting and fishing license every year. Uh, I think it's important to do, uh, and, I, and I think that there, we have to find ways uh, to increase the number of license sales, and I don't think raising the price of a, a license uh, accomplishes that. So uh, when uh, we, we asked for further uh, ideas on how we could fill that gap, that half a million dollar uh, operating a gap. Um, they talked about uh, the Salisbury fish hatchery. Now, the Salisbury fish hatchery, uh, for those who, who are aware, uh, is one of our oldest facilities. Uh, it's, uh, it's facing a capital expenditure in the very near future of about 12 to 15 million dollars uh, to upgrade. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's nutrient rich in, in that area, and uh, it's uh, discharging in an, into an impaired stream. Uh, so there's a need for a capital investment. Now they're also saying that even with the capital investment of 12 to 15 million dollars, uh, that that may not cure the problem. Uh, so uh, my suggestion was uh, there's four or five employees at, at the Salisbury facility, uh, and uh, can take into account that uh, we had uh, Roxbury, uh, Roxbury Fish Hatchery, which was destroyed by Irene, uh, was is just being uh, built uh, as we speak. We had a groundbreaking there where it's going to be another year, year and a half before that's put online. Uh, but when you take into account the production in uh, Roxbury, Roxbury produces, uh, anticipates uh, producing about 75,000 fish. Uh, Salisbury produces about 25,000 fish. Uh, so when I do the simple math on, on the costs associated with Salisbury and, and the uh, uh, looking into the future uh, with that capital investment, it makes more sense for me, uh, from my standpoint, to put more resources into the existing 
uh, existing facilities that we have, including Roxbury. So Roxbury is going to produce three times as many uh, fish at a reduced operating cost than Salisbury. Uh, and when you compare it to uh, some of the other uh, fish hatcheries throughout the state, uh, again, it, it pales in, in comparison. We, we produce about 1.3 million fish uh, out of our fish hatcheries uh, every single year. So uh, while Salisbury is very important, uh, it's, it's the smallest uh, of all and the most, uh, uh, the most costly. So I'm just looking for opportunities uh, to do things more efficiently. Uh, I believe that, uh, again, we've been without Roxbury, uh, those 75,000 fish over the last eight years since Irene. Uh, and when we put that back on the line, we'll actually uh, be increasing uh, the number of fish uh, produced in, in Vermont. Governor, I'm very impressed by your, your fish numbers. That was, <laughs> you really have your arms around that one. Yeah. <laughs> you were ready. <laughs> well, it's, it's important. You know, it really is. It's important to the uh, the sporting community, and, and I just thought it was important for me to take a, take a look at what, what we're actually doing. I, I certainly don't want to put, uh, push, put uh, our outdoor community at risk, the sportsmen at risk, and I don't believe this does it. So, uh, but, but I'm always open to, to ideas. Uh, we also use, you know, over the years, uh, I was chair of the, uh, of the uh, institutions committee. And, uh, and for years, uh, I advocated and worked with the Walleye Association uh, to try and uh, uh, use capital dollars, uh, fought for that over a number of years, and we were able to include that in our capital budget every single year. And they do it uh, privatized. Uh, they do it themselves. Uh, and uh, they do it at a, at a reduced cost in some respects. So there may be other opportunities as well for us to work with the uh, sporting community to make sure that we, we highlight, benefit, and expand uh, in that regard. Because we're known uh, for uh, good fishing in Vermont, and we want to maintain that. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, Governor, maybe all of you can opine on this. Um, what I'm wondering, with, you know, as you mentioned, you need new taxpayers in the state. You need to grow. Um, one thing that you're doing for that, or, you know, I'd like you to work with or ask you to answer this. Um, what are you doing about rural internet? And also, I moved here two years ago, and I wasn't able to take advantage of the homestead uh, reduction. Uh, if you have new homeowners coming into the state, you know they're going to have a higher tax than those who've been here for a while. Is there any way you can reduce that tax or make it more advantageous to come from home? Well, again, we're looking for a lot of opportunities, any opportunity we can uh, to be more attractive. Uh, uh, again, uh, I think some of the some of the tax burdens. Uh, that's why I'm so resistant to uh, to adding uh, to the tax burden in the state uh, because I believe that we're competing with other states uh, for for people for the workforce and 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 so forth. Um, so uh, uh, we're we came up with a couple of concepts working with the legislature. Uh, as you as you might uh, remember, there was the. Uh, uh, the uh, remote worker program uh, that uh, that offered uh, that's just coming online now that offered ten thousand uh, dollars per person to come to the state, and we received our, our share. This was a legislative uh, initiative that I thought I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but uh, certainly we had three thousand inquiries about that one program alone. Uh, we have enough money for about twenty five people, uh, so uh, it's not going to satisfy the need. Uh, but uh, but we received our share of criticism as well uh, about from people in the state saying, you know, uh, that's great. You're trying to, to help these people come to Vermont. But what about me? Uh, what are you doing for me? How, how are you helping? How are you helping me out? How about sending me a check for ten thousand dollars? I mean, we got that a lot, um, and I understand that. Uh, but but again, when you do the math and you look at the ripple effect, when you when you have that one uh, person that can work remotely and uh, buys a home and pays their taxes and sales taxes and so forth and so on, 
it only takes a couple of years to pay that back. Uh, so it's a, the return on investment is, is pretty good. Um, so from, from that standpoint, uh, we're looking for other initiatives uh, to bring people in. Um, what was the first part of your? Well, specifically, well, the rural internet is. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. I lost that part. Uh, so that's important, uh, obviously. Uh, there have been a couple of other, uh, a couple of other governors who have uh, made a commitment by a certain a period of time uh, to to have either cell service or broadband. I have not made that commitment, uh, but uh, but I think it's important to our state. Uh, we uh, uh, and the reason it hasn't been accomplished is it's expensive. Uh, but we are putting money in, in the uh, connectivity fund uh, this year. We think that that will be uh, beneficial. Uh, we are proposing uh, to uh, to have uh, some VITA funding uh, for communities that uh, that uh, don't have any in their in their communities and, and have a, a plan that they want to put forward. We want to help them in that that respect. And again, we're looking forward to working with the legislature uh, to find other opportunities uh, so that we can expand in that area. Yeah, just specifically, Lee, the, the governor mentioned the connectivity initiative, and uh, most of our effort, in fact, virtually all our effort this year in the budget is to work with both providers and with end users on that famous last mile, uh, which is so challenging. So the, the, there's uh, just under a million dollars uh, in the governor's proposed budget for the connectivity initiative, which would be targeted, most of it, towards uh, providers and sending them um, to bring capital and expertise to bear in rural communities. There's also a small uh, amount of money that is going to municipalities or, or towns to help them uh, devise plans uh, to become connected. And as the governor uh, mentioned a little earlier, we're also um, uh, seeding a revolving loan fund to work with VITA uh, that will provide loans to providers, um, again, to try to incent them and make it uh, economically worthwhile for them to roll out broadband into rural communities. So yes, the promise, uh, I think, very smartly has not been made that we'll be universal broadband, but we are putting our money where we think the need is, and that is one of the major needs in Vermont. Except for, well, it's, <clears throat> it's uh, the witching hour is approaching. Uh, I think it's uh, 8.49, so unless, do we have any other questions? Oh, Anne has a question. Well, first of all, the, the question is about minimum wage and uh, whether uh, that I would support any increase in that. Uh, first of all, I want all Vermonters to make more money. Uh, that's my goal as well. So when we look at common goals, I, I want Vermont to be more prosperous. I want Vermonters to make more money. Uh, I just am very concerned about the rural areas of our state, uh, particular, particularly the eastern uh, part of our state. Uh, we share a border, I don't know if some of you have heard, but we share a border with New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire uh, is known uh, for low taxes, uh, low, uh, uh, low in no income tax, uh, no sales tax, uh, uh, no corporate tax uh, that I know of. Uh, and, uh, but also, uh, they, have, uh, they have a low uh, minimum wage as well, 725. So we're, we're in conflict with them all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm just concerned uh, that uh, artificially raising the minimum wage is going to have a, a detrimental effect on a rural economy. And, and uh, that's something that I would like to avoid. We, we look at, uh, I travel the state a lot, and I see uh, some of the communities who are struggling uh, tr tremendously. We were up in the Northeast Kingdom uh, last week up in Essex County, in Canaan, and, and uh, Charleston, and, and Island Pond, and, and it's just, uh, you know, you get a sense uh, for what's what's happening uh, to our state. So again, uh, I want people uh, to make more money. Uh, we'll see where it goes in the legislature. Uh, I don't think it's I don't believe it's passed out of either body at this point. Uh, but uh, but I haven't put any lines in the sand. Uh, it's something that uh, I will contemplate. But but again, I would just advocate that. Uh, this could put our rural economy at risk. Uh, there, are, there are businesses that are just 
uh, on the edge uh, at this point in time, particularly on the, that eastern uh, border. Uh, and, that, and I believe that uh, that would just force them to either uh, reduce their hours, uh, work, uh, these mom and pops would just end up working more hours, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm not sure that that would benefit uh, all of, uh, of the rural, uh, rural economy. Thank you, Karen, did you have a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll lay down here a quick one. <laughs> okay. um, as you know, we're a Dellens rural state. That means that towns can only do those things that the legislature actually gives them permission to do. This year, we have a proposal. Um, we hope it comes out in bill form this week that would set up a pilot project, which would allow towns to apply for self-governance authority and um, to be able to make their own decisions about um, what happens within their borders affecting their local governance. And I'm wondering um, what your thoughts might be on that. Well, I appreciate local control. Uh, at the same time, I'm not sure what the ripple effect uh, of that would be. Uh, certainly willing to take a look. I hadn't heard that, uh, to be honest with you, Karen. Uh, but, uh, but we're more than willing to take a look uh, and, uh, and see what what effect that, that would have on the state. Uh, I'm just not sure uh, at this point in time. But I'd be happy to take a look. Anything? No, I hadn't, hadn't heard about that either. No. So we'll take a look. That's the thing that we out. <laughs> the ripple effects will be interesting. Good. Well, anyone else? We, uh, Colin? Or? I haven't asked a question yet. OK, and then we'll. we'll um, I think your approach to the legislature this year has been much more consistent with the sort of attitude that he brought to the state house as a senator. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, during the two years, during the last two years, sort of, why did you think taking a more combative approach to the legislature would be more effective? Well, again, I, I was uh, I ran on the premise uh, that we didn't need to raise tax and fees, uh, and that was. You know, my approach was I put a line in the sand, admittedly, put a line in the sand. We weren't going to raise tax and fees. I was going to uh, resist or veto anything that did. Uh, and that set up a bit of controversy, uh, uh, obviously. But, uh, but I thought it was important, and I think it was beneficial. It gave, uh, there was a correction uh, that, that uh, transpired as a result. Uh, I think it did uh, put more money in the pockets of Vermonters, uh, gave them some breathing room. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, the approach, uh, while it was, uh, it was controversial, uh, difficult, uh, but I thought it was necessary. Uh, but now is the time uh, to, again, reflect, do things differently. I don't want to, uh, uh, I, I think we need to, uh, to be respectful and civil. Uh, I will say, uh, throughout that whole or ordeal, uh, as messy as it, as it got, uh, as, as much drama as there might have been, uh, I never uh, mistreated anyone. I never, I always listened. Uh, I was respectful, I was civil, uh, and, uh, and I tried to follow through on anything that I said. So I, uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, that it's disrespectful, uh, but it was, it, it might have been difficult, and it certainly had its share of drama. And, and I guess taxes and fees is sort of one of the main issues. The other one is really putting a lot of pressure on downward cost <coughs> pressures on education. And it seems like that's something you're not doing this year. Is that because you just think it's useless, essentially? Well, again, uh, I, uh, there was a lot of resistance to that. Uh, and, and so I, I acknowledge that. And, and so I have to, uh, to put, uh, put our resources uh, towards areas that I think that we can uh, accomplish together. And I still believe that we spend a tremendous amount for education. It's one of the largest cost drivers for our property taxes and some of the uh, the tax pressures we're feeling, the burdens that Vermonters are feeling, uh, and that's going to be ongoing. Uh, but but I want to be collaborative. I, I want to work together. I want to to find a, a different a, a way uh, to to accomplish the same thing. And so I'm just looking for different ways to do that. There's always a way. If you can if you can agree to the goals, uh, then uh, it, it's just a, it's just maybe a different approach on how to get there. And it's like, a, I think of it as a map. When you want to get to point A, to, from point A to point B, uh, we all have different ways of getting there. Uh, and uh, so we just have to uh, respectfully uh, uh, debate on, on how to do that. And, and I'm looking forward to doing that. Can I ask one more question? 
Uh, down in Bennington, there's been sort of the main news story for us this week has been Matt Smish uh, going to court for um, illegal magazine, possessing illegal magazine devices. I know that piece of the bill was something he didn't really support. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering what you think of the situation down there, uh, whether you have concerns for the way it's being handled or anything like that. Well, again, it's law. So uh, if you violate the law, I, I understand that that's uh, um, was uh, part of the investigation. Uh, he was cited uh, for that. Uh, and uh, it's the law whether, again, I signed every single uh, bill. Uh, so in the end, I did support that. Uh, it wasn't something that was high on my priority list in terms of the magazines, uh, but I uh, but it's but it's law now, and, and we'll debate that. Uh, I think today it's in the Supreme Court, so so we'll find out uh, where we go from here. Thank you. Long answer, probably. <laughs> um, where do you stand on the abortion issues? Yeah, uh, while well, it won't be a long answer, I, I've. Uh, you know, I'm, I believe in a woman's right to choose. Uh, I'm pro-choice, uh, and I believe that uh, it's got a long ways to go as it works its way through the legislative process. I think that uh, what this is a result of some uh, fear uh, on the federal level of what was going to happen uh, to that, uh, that uh, a woman's right to choose. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's uh, a still uh, the case protecting Roe v. Wade is important, uh, and uh, and codifying that was what that was how it was explained to me in the beginning, and I'm supportive of of codifying uh, Roe v. Wade. Now, what Roe v. Wade means uh, to to each and every one of us uh, is probably an area that's going to be debated, uh, and I think that that's uh, what we'll see in the legislature. But I think it's. For, for them uh, to work uh, their way through it. Uh, but, but again, I believe in a woman's right to choose, and I'm, I'm pro-choice. Governor, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks thank you, Suzanne. Having. Thank you, Adam. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you all.